Hey folks, it's Eugene Lee Show here and welcome to episode 31 of Forensics Talks. So we're making some headway here. Uh, before we begin today, just a couple of quick announcements and then we'll get right into it. Uh, the first one is that next week, May 4th to 5th, we're going to be having our Cloud Compare course. So if you are working at all with any 3D technologies, with point cloud data, with photogrammetry data, working with drones, um, Cloud Compare is a fantastic program to learn. We're going to be doing the Zero to Hero course, and that's really going to take you right from the basics to some of the advanced topics like the registration and in the uh, 3D deviation analysis. The other thing that I want to get across here is that next week, the Canadian, or I shouldn't say next week, but uh, the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference is going to be having their um, a conference on June 21st to 24th, 2021. And this is going to be a virtual conference. And uh, we're inviting everybody. This is open to everybody, not just members, uh, but people internationally. And the abstracts uh, submission are, our submissions are due tomorrow. So we're getting kind of uh, full. Um, but if you have any problems at all, um, or I don't know if something comes up or whatever, maybe you need a, a bit more time, you can uh, just email us at the conference 2021 at csfs.ca below. So uh, make sure uh, that you get those abstracts in. We have some great speakers lined up next week. Uh, I expect that we're going to be having the schedule out. So those of you that are kind of hanging back and saying, hey, I want to see what's, what kind of topics are being covered and that sort of thing. Everything from ident, pathology, uh, toxicology, chemistry, um, uh, firearms, uh, just the whole blood stain pattern analysis, a whole bunch of different areas. So I think we're going to have that, uh, that covered for sure. All right. Well, this week we're going to be doing something a little bit different. And the reason for that is the guest that we had or that we're going to be having, uh, coming up here is, uh, living in Perth, Australia. So Dr. Paula Magni, She's a senior lecturer at Murdoch University in Perth. And unfortunately, 2 p.m. Eastern in the afternoon is 2 a.m. her time. So I wasn't going to ask her to uh, speak at 2 a.m. her time. Uh, that wouldn't be fair. But, um, you know, I asked Paula about her work and the kind of stuff that she's doing. And she's going to explain at length about um, how she got involved in this area. She goes into the aquatic, uh, aquatic forensics. And it was really, really interesting stuff, very novel. And uh, I think she's doing some great work. So without further ado, I'm going to play the recording of the interview that I had with her. And uh, I'll come back uh, once that, that is over. Enjoy, folks. We'll see you soon. Hi, Paolo. Thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate you uh, coming in uh, under quarantine or not quarantine, but under lockdown, just like us. Thank you for having me. It's a good way to break out this quarantine lockdown in Perth. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I know. Uh, yeah, here we having uh, some heavy restrictions and things like that. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, soon with the vaccinations and everything else, we'll, we'll be able to get back to normal because I think most people are getting tired of being indoors. <laughs> so absolutely. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. So first thing, first thing I, I typically ask a lot of the uh, people that I interview is just about their story and how they got involved. So if you can, I'd like you to go back to before you were Dr. Paola Magni and, you know, kind of still thinking about what am I going to do? You know, were you always interested in forensics? Was it something that you fell into? How did that, how did that go for you? Well, my story starts uh, back in the beautiful country of Italy because I was born and raised uh, in Italy, in Turin, the northwest of the country, uh, and I always had a passion for nature. Um, back in the days, forensic science was not a thing. There was no CSI on TV. Uh, the maximum we could find would be uh, probably some Mother She Wrote uh, TV series or, or maybe some Agatha Christie book that I loved but was not exactly what I figured myself to be one day. Uh, but I was really, really interested in uh, nature, uh, biology, everything that was alive uh, around me. And I was collecting from little bugs to minerals, uh, rocks, uh, any kind of things that was coming from nature was at some point coming back to my house and <laughs> making my mom freak out and things like that. <laughs> so, um, it uh, was pretty, pretty natural for me uh, deciding for a, a university a pathway that was science, natural sciences. That is, a, um, that is a discipline that is between biology and geology. So the idea to have a, a general overlook of the nature around. So the biologists 
looks at a tree and looks at the uh, trunk and the leaves, the geologist will maybe look at the soil, but uh, a person that studies natural sciences will look after the, the tree, the soil, uh, the air around, and maybe also to the people who is looking uh, to, the, uh, to the plant. So also an anthropological side of the story. And when I was studying natural sciences was back in the days, so it was not like a situation of three plus two, maybe you do research, you don't do research. It was a long journey of about five years uh, with a big research. And when, uh, when there was the time for me to do research, I was uh, extremely inter interested in uh, marine biology, but living in a, uh, in, a <laughs> in a city that was 250 kilometers far away from the sea uh, was going to be a bit difficult. They proposed me some aquaria kind of work, but I was not that happy. And uh, things happened, and uh, um, I was proposed with something completely different, working on genetics of toads and frogs. And they sent me to uh, remote Kazakhstan uh, for this adventure and uh, uh, to collect these samples. And it was amazing. It was an inc incredible experience. And I was even more in love with nature, but at the same time, I was not in love with the topic itself because I felt like, well, I'm learning more about the genetics of these uh, very cool animals. I can kiss a lot of frogs and see if I can find my prince. <laughs> uh, but when I come back home, I don't feel very useful. This is information that is pretty much science for science. Mm -hmm. I am more an applicative, more pragmatic, more a hands-on person. So I gave myself some time and uh, I, I decided to change some of the uh, subject that I was studying and I removed astronomy and I put entomology. And one of the first uh, classes that the professor was giving to us uh, was, uh, was about bugs and society, bugs in the world. And he was saying, was, he simply started with a, with a statement saying, insects are everywhere. Fair enough, <laughs> uh, but they're not that much studied because there are so many and there are not that many entomologists. Mm -hmm. So um, some entomologists study insects because they're beautiful, butterflies, beetles and things like that, uh, or because they're very useful, like pollinators, bees and similar, or because they're very dangerous, like imagine every vector is of whatever disease. Oh, and by the way, he added, um, in the last few years, a group of entomologists and pathologists are studying insects that can be found at the crime scene uh, to give more information to, uh, to the law enforcement to mm -hmm. uh, persecute cases, not just murders, but biosecurity cases, stored product uh, kind of cases. And this was like, oh, I, I have no idea. It, probably in the, full, in the whole class, mm -hmm. I was the only one who was listening. But for me, it was a, a revelation, was like an epiphany, a big, you know, bow, boom, wow. So I can actually use a piece of nature, insects, that is actually a pretty big piece of nature for something that is extremely applicative, something that is even for justice or for everyone to mm -hmm. give closure to, to families and to give justice to victims. I feel to myself, wow, this is incredible. Um, came back home on the same day, there was no Google, so you can figure out all the, <laughs> all the mine up. And so I tried to look after something on the web. There was something at the uh, Natural History Museum of London. Uh, there was a group of uh, forensic entomologists working there. And just for chance, in the next three or four months, uh, there was the, uh, um, the conference of the Forensic Entomology, European Association for Forensic Entomology. So, well, tour in London, there is a, a low cost, there used to be a low cost flight. And yes. yeah, on the same day, I bought my ticket and I said, well, if it's something that I really interest, I'm really interested in, I will figure out on the day. And so I found myself immersed in three days of this topic and I really, really fell in love. Yeah. Um, because there was a little bit of everything, the conference was actually very small. The community of forensic entomologists nowadays is still less than 300 people, but back in the days, I think it was a 50, uh, 50 people uh, exercise. Yeah. And when, when my was English, this? What, what, what year <laughs> this was, was this? Oh, oh my God, it was 2001, something okay. like that. Okay. So, so my English was definitely not as good as it is now that I'm living in another country for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, was very school-based kind of English. 
I was, uh, I read something before I met the people who wrote the papers. I, I was still a student, so very shy and very, you know, all of these professors and things for me were like movie stars. I was basically in the Hollywood of science. <laughs> so I was absolute. And then the, you know, the, the frame of the Natural History Museum in London mm -hmm. is incredible. So I think the whole situation was uh was what made me feel fall in love um with the discipline and also the idea that the world is your oyster when it comes to entomology you can use insects everywhere from uh water to glasses to desert to the to your cupboard and uh crimes can happen anywhere so you can right, be right. useful everywhere in the world but also in your city things happen uh in the bush or in an apartment you can be useful so from that point i came back to uh, turin and i knocked to the door of the professor <laughs> and i said well i'm very interested in this can you can you be my supervisor for a uh, for a thesis for for a research and he was like <laughs> i would love to because the topic is extremely interesting and uh, in italy is still very in, in, in a really an embryonal stage yeah um but I'm not very, um, I have no idea. I work on micro lepidopter, so micro butterflies. So better for you to find somebody to, to help you out and I will, uh, um, I will help you out as well and things. So um, <laughs> in some cases, you just have to forget to be shy uh, uh, and just try everything. Mm -hmm. You really, <laughs> then I started to study a little bit more about flies and apparently uh, Egyptians, uh, Egyptians' heroes are, are are considered flies because they bother the enemy until the enemy, in, in basically, <laughs> worst case scenario, they kill them. So you right. had to be like a fly. You had to be very annoying. So I started to be like a fly. <laughs> so I knocked to the door of the um, uh, pathology department, the chief of the pathology department, and the police in Turin, uh, and the carabinieri, because in Italy we have two different type of police, the military yeah. and the military. And I said, I want to do this. Can you help me out? Can you allow me to do this? Um, and I found very positive answers. And then I realized why. <laughs> so it's not that they want my uh, pretty face at the crime scene or they want me, uh, uh, for whatever reason, help me. They just hate bugs. They hate having cases with uh, dead people crawling with maggots. Yeah. So having someone coming to the scene or to the autopsy, collecting their bugs and doing this nasty job for them was gold <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a, a good a good deal between uh, them and i and i had the opportunity to work for about two two years uh, on collecting um uh, cases and uh and um all the entomological samples from different cases so i create myself a huge database about uh, the insects uh, in uh, in the city of Turin and surrounding area because then you know pathologists speak to each other there is this girl that does this uh, you can uh, you can have her help and things mm -hmm. so that was a, a interesting uh, period of my life i was learning day by day and uh, a city like Turin with lots of people, lots of elderly people that uh, unfortunately uh, die alone in the houses. Well, I had lots of lots of data for for my thesis to the point that when I presented my <laughs> my results, I was immediately asked by um, an editing house to make my thesis in a book. Oh, okay. And uh, so at the early age of 25, I was uh, the first author of uh, uh, a forensic entomology book that is still used today for universities and, and law enforcement that's great and um and then from that point i started to to work for the health department we put together a proper forensic entomology lab mm -hmm. and the cases were really really coming from everywhere in the country in every environment and as you know italy is a peninsula with lots yeah. of water uh, water that is sea water fresh water water that you can find on uh, on land as a as bathtub or, or a, a wells or a, a cisterns and many of these environments can be a very good place to hide a body or to you know to 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 create more difficult situations right, so right. i've started to move from forensic entomology in, for, in a in terrestrial environment to aquatic environments in which people think there are no insects in water 
is not true <laughs> because many mm -hmm. insects, especially in fresh water, they have stages of life. Uh, we also have bodies that can float and flies can reach the floating bodies. And when we move to the sea, maybe we don't have flies, but we have their cousins, their crustaceans. Right, 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 right. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so we don't want to have cockroaches in, in our food, but when we have a lobster, it's basically the cockroach it of is the, the sea. Cockroach, yeah. <laughs> so true. sorry for everyone who loves <laughs> <laughs> this kind so of thing. So how did you make your way to, I mean, you're, you're in Perth right now. And actually, well, you're, you're literally, if, if I, if you draw a line from where I am, where you are, we are on opposite sides of the world, almost exactly. If, if I, if, if I dig a hole from my office, I might pop up in your university classroom. So it's funny. Yeah. But, and uh, they say, and they say that if you, uh, if you make a hole from, uh, from Italy to, uh, to the other side, you end up in New Zealand. That is actually Italy, but reverse in, uh -huh. uh, in terms of, of shape. So yeah. yeah, I'm actually the other side of the world and why it is. We come back to the Natural History Museum on that first day of conference. Uh, the first person I actually met was um, uh, was a professor who was, I was the first one at the conference arriving so five minutes before starting, was nobody else because it's, you know, the, the typical uh, welcome drink and nobody arrives in time for that. But I didn't know, it was my first conference. And there was this professor sitting on a chair half asleep, who was an Australian professor in a completely jet lag. Um, so my conversation started with this person who was uh, the director of the Center for Forensic Science at UWA, University of Western Australia, okay. uh, Professor Ian Dader. And uh, our friendship started that time and uh, I was still a, a, a student, like a master, a master owner's bachelor mm -hmm. student was all combined. And years later, when I started my PhD, um, he invited me over for a, for an internship period. And, uh, and, and then the, the relationship, like professional relationship, uh, flourished and, uh, he wanted me for a postdoc. And, and that was it. So I moved to, uh, to Perth and, uh, and basically I stayed. That's awesome. So, well, let's, let's get into it. I, uh, you know, I know you do a lot of different things and you're teaching and you have a lot of, uh, you know, you get your students and you even, uh, well, I know you're, you're interested in education, obviously. And you even, you had some kind of a, you did, you did some kind of a re or relationship or something with students in Malaysia. Can you tell me about that? Yes, so my uh, professional figure at the at Murdoch University is divided in three different, uh, let's say, uh, streams, uh, teaching, research and service. So teaching uh, is about teaching what I uh, what I know, what I love, what I'm passionate about. Uh, research is the same story, but working with students at different levels for, for research and services to bring the university at different levels uh, around the world. So also in my role, I'm the deputy of Murdoch Singapore. So last year, before COVID, I was living in Singapore as well. Uh, I'm very interested in, um, in bre <laughs> breaking the barriers of forensic science. Mm -hmm. uh, what I keep saying is that crime scene can happen anywhere. Uh, and we are, as forensic scientists or practitioners, uh, called on the scene in your country or in another country either because we are the only specialists who can work in a certain uh, discipline or simply because we are in charge with victims or with crimes that happen somewhere else. Like for example, a mass disaster. Uh, but we also have to think that crimes and criminals can also travel because this is what happens. And uh, imagine a situation of a, a, a tourist that is gets hurt or killed somewhere else, mm -hmm. and is an Australian tourist in Malaysia or somewhere else, is is the, the law enforcement of Australia that has to go there and investigate um, working alongside the, the local police. So we, uh, as, as teachers, I think we should be committed in teaching students to work everywhere in the world, to understand that there are no barriers in a, in a, in, a, in forensic science that we had to learn how to communicate with the other parts, how the other people work, what kind of um, uh, resources they have, what kind of strength and limit they have. And also another thing, crime is a crime only if the law say so. Right. And something that is a crime here in Australia or back in Italy, maybe it's not somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Basic thing, eating dog food. <laughs> like, sorry, <laughs> eating, eating dishes made of dog. Dog, yeah. 
and I'm not talking about hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> so you go to China, it's it's normal. But if you do that here in Australia or do that in Italy, well, it's going to be an issue. So yeah. you have to understand that things are different mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes the law is not evolved in certain way or others. So I had the opportunity uh, to apply for funds, for teaching funds uh, through the uh, something that is called the New Colombo Plan Projects of the Australian government. And I was successful in a project that was called Breaking Barriers. And the idea was breaking barriers for, uh, for students of forensic mm -hmm. science to work together alongside uh, forensic students in Malaysia. I've chosen Malaysia because, well, it's not far away. And uh, I have a great relationship with a uh, uh, UKM Forensics, who is um, a university in um, in Selangor in Banji. Uh, a PhD, we were the, the director of the center and myself, we were PhD students together. Uh, we met in these conferences, these golden conferences, apparently. We kept in contact and we said one day we will work together. And we were not just working together, but our students were working together. Oh, that's great. So, um, we create the, yeah, we create these programs in which there were simulations of uh, crime, sim simple crime, one victim of mass disasters, in which we had um, combined teams of Malaysian students and Australian students working together uh, to solve the case and present the case in front of an audience, present the case in front of a mock court, but also present in front of schools. So improving not just the uh, technical skills, but also the communication skills at different level. Try to let them, let people that understand the topic understand, so prof in a professional way, but also try to uh, don't use jargon and let everyone understand. Because at the end of the day, in the courtroom where you are an expert, you can have a jury that is made by random people. And the case is not solved because I, as an expert, say the right thing, but as I, as an expert, say the thing that the jury understand. Right, of course. So it's, a, it's a very gray line there, and yeah. our student has to understand these. So they have to be ready to be uh, communicative in a, pro in a professional way, but also in a simple way in order for everyone to be able to understand. Right, right, excellent. Well, let's get into it. I wanna talk about the aquatic forensics. First off, what is different in your mind? What are some of the major differences when we talk about a body that's found in a, in a terrestrial environment versus underwater? Right oh, off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we should be, this interview will be very, very long. If I touch <laughs> okay, every just, single just the highlights, the highlights. <laughs> the, the basic highlights is, for example, the fact that Typically, in an, a terrestrial situation, the body is found where the body is margin. Ma majority of the situation, water moves, so the body can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the movement of a body in a terrestrial environment can happen because of macro scavengers or animals, or because they want to move a body to, to hide the body. But this movement can be in two directions normally you know, in the space, mm -hmm. but in the water is in three directions. So we have a depth and we have a movement all, all around. Uh, the decomposition process takes the body to go up and down because of the production of, of gas. And, uh, and then there are tides, currents and uh, waves that takes the body everywhere. Right. Uh, in water, we can't control the, um, uh, the, the scavengers because this, especially in places like Perth, there are lots of sharks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it can be a very quick uh, turnaround of, uh, of the composition, colonization and things like that. Okay. In, in water, we don't have proper colonizers. They are also decompositors. So what we have in terrestrial environment that is flies that arrive and consume the body and leave traces that can be used as a biological clock in water doesn't happen that that well there are some animals that are typical of decomposition but they don't the the, the biological clock is not there right the so, other thing is that <laughs> we don't have many research done in water either fresh water or, or, or salt water because it's very hard it takes a long time takes mm -hmm. lots of permissions imagine putting something organic in water how many opportunities of hazard biological hazard you can have so they don't give you the opportunity to do any any experiment N not many experts uh, the equipment is very is is way more expensive there is no 
proper equipment for aquatic environments, we can reach some aquatic environments. So terrestrial environment can be difficult. I had a case at the top of a mountain because some bears were poisoned by uh, poachers, but we use the helicopter. But if you have a situation, let's say Titanic, yeah, yeah. We, we still do, we still don't know what the MH370 is. Right. It's it's not <laughs> it's not a small thing. It's a plane mm. with lots of people. So sometimes we can't reach. We can't even find where the crime scene is or where the victims are. Right. So, yeah. And uh, and the other but, thing, the world is covered by water 80%. So we have more chances that's <laughs> over right. there. So is it fair to say that on, you know, on land, when you have a body that's buried or, or it's on the surface or whatever, that there are uh, better indicators for the time since death? Absolutely. Because yeah. there are more research that have been conducted uh, in terrestrial environment from <laughs> well, they started in the fourth century with a uh, with the observation of some Chinese uh, uh, people killing someone and using the um, the little tool for for rice to understand where the flies are and where the blood is and things like that to continue with the proper forensic entomology is was is born in uh, at the end of the eighteen hundred. So we have a history in terrestrial environment. We don't have that yet in okay. aquatic environment when the uh when the human body starts to decay in water um obviously i can imagine um i can imagine a few things for example that the, and the temperature always comes up whenever you talk to an entomologist it, temperature is a huge factor but also i'm wondering if the body still undergoes some uh, predictable changes. So for example, I, a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a couple of months ago, I spoke with, uh, Dr. Sherry Forbes, who's Australian and she's now, uh, in Quebec, uh, with the, with, uh, uh a, a body farm, let's call it. And, uh, she talked about adipocere and a number of different chemicals and stuff like that. And I also noticed that one of your papers, uh, I believe that you also mentioned adipocere in water and that it's, it's prevalent on the body as well. So are there any chemicals or any other indicators just on the body itself? If you had, if, if you didn't have crustaceans or other animals that could give you any kind of indication, or is it just, we just don't have a good handle on that now? It's very, the, the composition in water kind of follow the stages of the composition in a terrestrial environment but with different type, time, of time frame that, because it's based on the uh, water temperature but also other things like <sighs> imagine a situation in which you have a naked body or a body with just a few clothes or you have somebody dressed up with a, like a scuba diver with a full uh, scuba diving suit that keeps everything together. Mm -hmm. So these are two important indicators of, of what, how the, the composition will go faster if, um, if the body is naked and weighs lower if the body is all contained uh, in something. Adipocere is extremely important. Shari studied that from the chemical point of view uh, a lot in terrestrial environment, a little bit in water. Uh, what we did was a good review of everything that ha can happen in a, uh, how and when you can have adipocere. You can have adipocere in terrestrial environment when it's uh, very humid. Uh, in aquatic environment can happen as well but depends on the body itself. You need to have body fat to mm -hmm. have a deposit. So sometimes you don't have it. Sometimes you have only in certain part of the body. Like for example, if you have shoes, you will have that inside of the shoes, but the rest of the body maybe can be eaten right, by, by right. fish. So it's every case is incre incredibly unique in terms of the composition in aquatic environments. Yeah. Um, you can also have the opportunity to use plankton um, because depending on the cause of death, uh, if it's drowning, uh, one of the opportunities for the, the plankton is to come in when you breathe water, you know, but the plankton has to be there. And when I talk about plankton, I'm not talking about all the plankton, I'm talking especially uh, indicators like diatoms, diatoms because they have certain structures that allow us to do some chemical analysis, the diatom test that can give us information. But there are limitations for that. Like if you eat a lot of seafood, maybe you have diatoms in your body already. Uh, mm -hmm. Or uh, if you have exposed bones with foreign of bones or holes in the bones already available, they can get in. And so you can have positive or negative results that can be false or uh, negative, okay. false positive results. 
Let's, uh, I, I didn't know I was going to be doing so much research on barnacles when I, when I first was <laughs> going to interview you. So let me, let me ask about that. So barnacles are, a, it, it's a type of, uh, anthropod, right? Like they're, uh, like just like insects or spiders and it's, uh, they're a crustacean. Is that correct? They are crustaceans. So okay. basically they are crabs, but they don't move. Okay. So what kind of, uh, in terms of where they, where they're found and where they live or what kind of temperatures do they prefer to live in? Where, where can we find uh, barnacles? So barnacles, if you have a boat or if you work in oil and gas, you know that barnacles are your worst enemy because they uh, have um, planktonic larvae. Uh, so babies that live in the plankton that can attach ex extremely quick on something that is floating or that is uh, in general underwater. And when they attach, it's very, very hard to detach to the point that we as humans are study the cement, so the glue that they produce to mm -hmm. make our glues. So the best glues that we have in, in, in commerce are based on uh, the chemicals of uh, produced by barnacles. So can you imagine that? Uh, when they attach, they start growing and they grow based on a, a table of growth that are based on aquatic temperature, water temperature. So uh, it's very easy for them to attach on uh, a body that is floating. Uh, in my cases, I found especially uh, attachment on shoes and on clothes, uh, on bones, uh, a little less on uh, on the skin. Only a recent case that we had, uh, they were attached on the skin, but the skin was very hard because of the adiposphere. Mm. Uh, so they choose kind of their substrate and, and they grow faster or slower. Uh, it, different temperature, they are in different species depending where they attach because there is a biogeography about that. And there are interesting um, development, 2.0 kind of studies of mm -hmm. barnacles in which uh, you can study the shell of the barnacle uh, from the chemical point of view, from the uh, isotopes point of view. And the isotopes, in particular the oxygen, um, can give you information about the temperature of the water that the body and the barnacle traveled. So the idea is that the body, you find the body somewhere and the body can come from point A and you are in point B. Now from point A to B can be a simple way like this or can be another way like that. Mm -hmm. How you can find out? Well, in the barnacle shell, maybe there is this journey because we can follow the temperature of the water through the uh, lines of, of the shell, pretty much like a like a tree with uh, all the um, the rings. So they provide you the rings of the temperature of the water. I see. Okay. So does it, do they? Uh, it, the, the, I mean, with trees, they normally go in years. So, you know, like you'll you'll count like years. But in in the barnacle, what, what what's the time uh, sequence that you have to know the temperature of the water and then yes. kind of count from there? Yes, yeah. So uh, I like to explain this to the students uh, in a very easy way. It's like a loyalty card. So you get more points, and more time based on the uh, aquatic or terrestrial <laughs> temperature. Uh, it's, the age is not made on the age as we think about age normally, it's based on temperature age. So if I want to keep myself young, if, I'm, if I was a fly or a barnacle, I should sleep in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the, uh, it's interesting because in like, for example, I have a, an image on the screen right now, it's a shoe and it has some, you know, some barnacles, or some, some growth on it as, as well. But, um, sometimes, uh, you said that people can just mistake it for like dirt or something like that's attached to it. If they're, if they're small enough, right. Because, um, they're, they're tiny. And, um, do they, are they just, they just floating around in the water kind of thing? And then they just find something and they just attach to it. I mean, they attach to animals, they attach to boats. They, uh, how do they, how do they get to the point where they're mobile? Yeah. So they, their larvae, so their babies, let's say, uh, it's a, it's a mobile larvae that lives in the plankton and the, the larvae has a nice little antennas. The antennas can touch different surfaces. And when they find the surface that they like, they decide to turn around and attach. So it's an evolutionary um, tract that is very important at this stage because when they choose the place, they choose the place forever. Mm -hmm. So you you don't have the possibility like other animals that can move because uh, the surface is not good anymore. It's a big choice. It's your place forever. So 
they are selected by nature to choose the best ways. Um, okay. And normally, for example, they don't choose as something that is very uh, soft because they know that if something soft is going to decompose and going to fall down. And if they fall down, especially these barnacles that you showed before, they are typical of uh, floating, so, so the surface of the water, they don't want to mm -hmm. stay at the bottom, they want to stay at the top, so they know what they want. Um, so yeah, the decision is made on the on the surface, on the and um, and also on the amount of panicles already present because they try to obviously avoid crowd places because if not, if they stay all together, they will not have enough food. Uh, so there are a few things that I had to consider, even mm -hmm. if they don't have a brain. <laughs> yeah, no, but they do attach to clothing because there are some in your papers I've seen. You know, they they get on pants or, or whatever so yeah. they, they yeah. can be all over and in fact i think it's maybe perhaps more rare but you do you also find it on skin yeah so the paper that you showed before with the shoe uh, in this case that was a single case with a, a person that was wearing some winter clothes and right. shoes and so they had the opportunity to attach on different things uh, just to try to understand if they have a preference uh, between different shoes or between different clothes, then we had a follow-up experiment on purpose, that is the one that you're showing at the moment. With regards to shoes, uh, we wanted to know if they have a preference between uh, the uh, elegant shoes, so made in leather, or um, <laughs> or gym shoes made in a more uh, like in a uh, plastic and, and, mm -hmm. and fabric. And then we did another job, uh, another research, using four different fabrics. So we used cotton, uh, we used satin, we used velvet, and we used neoprene. Which one is going to be the favorite? Because um, not that you wear very much neoprene on, on your cotton jeans, but uh, people can wear different things. And which one are the barnacles that will provide you with more information? The one that attach on your shoes, the one that attach on your jeans, the one that attach on your neoprene jacket. And uh, we found that uh, barnacles have a preference for something, and it's always a preference for something that is not organic. Mm. because they they kind of feel, they kind of know that this is something that is not going to degradate in water. So nice. we had a huge difference between stuff that was attached on cotton and uh, on neoprene. And uh, if you think about the shoes, well, they prefer elegant shoes, so they are very <laughs> fashionable. <laughs> you didn't uh, know it. They don't feel a versus Adidas or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we use, uh, this, this is the annoying part of the uh, experiment. You had to have repetition. They're all the same. So uh, I like to say that I like science and fashion. So it's... Uh, they the best for a for a female scientist into fashion is going and buy 124 shoes <laughs> of one type or another one but then it's going to be all the same time so it's a it's a bit it's a bit boring yeah, but yeah it's, sure. it's very interesting like the body in general in water will give you less information than the clothes if the clothes are pleasant you will jump into this uh, uh, textile analysis forensic textile uh, analysis that can give us information because the the fabric degradates but also the animals can go inside and can go or, or can go in, on the surface so uh, even for the diatoms some i had cases in which we use diatoms not in the body of the victim but in the clothes of the per possible yes. suspect or perpetrator so textile analysis is great and can be highly combined with traces from nature okay um how accurately like knowing uh, the the sort of the growth stages and the temperatures and things like that i don't know if there's any, been any blind studies where people have tried to estimate the age with known but how accurately can you determine you know the time since death or the time since you know the body's been in the water uh it's it's hard <laughs> it's definitely hard and it's definitely um um a differential diagnosis that you had to consider. So uh, you cannot do that by yourself, just considering barnacles. You have to do that considering uh, the transformation of the body. So you work together with a, a pathologist or an anthropologist, and then uh, you consider uh, the trace analysis of the clothing uh, if if they are present. So textile analysis, and then the barnacles, and then uh, the um, not just the size of the barnacles but the species and the bloom in the in the different period of the year so from the ecological point of view and things like that um 
sometimes animals cannot help. Uh, so uh, we tried to, to use the same fabrics that we used in, the, in our experiment uh, from the point of view of the, of the hyperspectral imaging. So what is the reflectance that they provide us uh, in the part that they don't, they're not colonized in comparison with the presence of biological uh, traces. So trying to have as many indicators as possible to pinpoint, to, you know, to shortlist the time uh, frame is the best opportunity. Okay. Sometimes we don't have the opportunity, so it's, it's hard. But there are tables that can give us information. Like you find the, the brain sub, uh, in a deposit, it's around this time, you had the panicle this, in this stage, so this allows us to um, make the time a little bit more tighter, mm -hmm. and then the fabrics take that time, so we go, we kind of filter the information until we get as best as we can. We, we're not going to provide a time like Jessica Fletcher time and, <laughs> yeah, time yeah. and day and time. A every movie you, you see this lady, uh, the victim always break the, the watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, is it, is it, but is it like, oh, like I'm just trying to get an idea. Is it like you could say, well, it was kind of like in this two week period or this two week window or something like that. Or is it like, uh, you know, in this month, it, yeah. Is the is the same situation with uh, with forensic and pure, say forensic entomology, in which when you have only one uh, cycle of life of flies, mm -hmm. you are more precise than having many many cycle of life. Uh, one after the other. If you have more successional waves, you can you can't be that precise. Right, right. Barnacles grow, but doesn't mean that they grow from now to forever. At some point, they are let's say adult and they don't grow anymore so mm -hmm. if i find the body when the barnacles is small is it juvenile or is still going to become to the maximum size i can be more precise than if the barnacle is already at the maximum growth i can say only the minimum time in which the body is in water is that time if it stays longer mm -hmm. I, I can't have because the barnacles doesn't grow anymore yeah. So I can say a minimum. So it depends on the situation okay. and uh, on the on the assemblage that you have, because maybe you can have more than one generation or more than one species. So one species can give you a time frame. The other species grow for longer time. The other species arrive later. So yeah, yeah. You you had mentioned the. Uh... Uh, like okay you talked about like organic surfaces and that they maybe they like harder sort like boats you mentioned you know they and it's true they they wreak havoc on boats and things like that but also like i'm just trying to think about the case that you mentioned which was the uh malaysia airlines the mh370 that you had a date for that that was uh march 8 2014 uh and i think it left from kuala lumpur and then it was going to like beijing or something but we know that it, it, that was the day that it disappeared. So, but there there were uh, parts, right? Didn't didn't you guys? Uh, there were parts that were found. Yeah, there were parts that were found, and they were full of barnacles. Uh, look, I never had the opportunity to look into that. I saw pictures, and they looked to me the same the same speech that I found on my shoes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very excited about that, but obviously not having the opportunity to to have the samples. You only have pictures from from the media, and God only knows yeah. if you, what you see is the maximum size or the only species that you have, and it's not a proper macro uh, picture taken. I was like, oh my god, this is so <laughs> it will be so interesting, and maybe I can help, maybe I cannot. Uh, I'm sure that, that they, um, I think the French law enforcement that looked after that did whatever was possible. And yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> These yeah, are I mystery. Know. Yeah, it's funny. Like, and sometimes I do that too. Like, I'll see, I'll see something happening in the media or whatever, and I'm like, wow, that would be a perfect case for me or something like that, right? So this is would have been a really good opportunity for you, probably. Yeah, and and uh, it happened a few times in which I tweet something about this is a case that uh, can be can be studied in for, in aquatic forensic mm -hmm. uh, field, and then a journalist uh, reached out saying, "What do you mean? Uh, I mean that." In this case, there is this opportunity from the scientific point of view. There is there is this opportunity. I'm not saying that I can solve the case. I'm not Sherlock Holmes, uh, but there is an opportunity to use this science that is not very known and is not very known by even scientists. And so you can imagine a, a public prosecutor or a judge that don't have a scientific background, mm -hmm. and this is something cutting edge because it's something that is only in the last few years that is considered. So sometimes. 
I had the opportunity to start working on a case and as an expert more because of my tweet or an article that came on a female magazine and the prosecutor was a female prosecutor and the hairdresser was looking at the magazine because, oh, oh so there is an expert that does that. That's pretty mm -hmm. cool. So you never know. You never know. There is not a list of experts. So um, science communication can come in different ways. So even even through a female magazine, you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now the um, like for example here in Canada, there was there was a, it was a while back now, but there was uh, on the west side in Vancouver, there were cases where there were there were body parts coming up, like feet and things like that. So, yeah. and I think I thought in us there was a case. Uh, in that you commented on i think it was melissa caddick and she's yes. like a it's like some kind of a, a financial investment scam artist or whatever and then she goes missing and then i guess they find her her part or parts of her body or whatever uh, did, did you do anything on that one or were you just commenting on it i started commenting on that starting through through twitter and then i spoke with some journalists and was like what do you think about that so well, i work on shoes they got you guys found the, found the shoes yeah i can't i can't comment on barnacles because from the picture i can't see any but the fact that you can't see any knowing how fast they grow how fast they uh, they colonize it's kind of a weird situation mm. and then there was some conversation started that i cannot go into that uh, so let's see what uh, what the future will be will bring yeah, us sure. starting okay. from that case well how are you you know you say they grow fast so what i mean if you were to like for example the shoes that you did the experiment with uh, all the all the different shoes i'll just bring the picture back up here if i drop in a pair of shoes if i'm in perth and i and i drop a pair of shoes and, and drop them at the bottom of the the ocean or whatever how long before i'm going to be seeing some of these if, you, if you if you scroll down this article you will see a chart in which i show um the the colonization of the different shoes the first colonization uh, happened after 15 days oh, okay uh, in in this uh in this in this one so uh, obviously the the initial colonization is very tiny uh, only let's say the expert eyes can spot the the, the presence of the uh of the let's say baby barnacle uh, attached to the shoe but it's there um so obviously we had to consider that we decided to start this uh, experiment in a i believe in a summer or spring period in which the temperature of the water was good enough for the larvae to be active and uh, able to attach if we were starting in a, uh, in a very cold water period it would probably take longer mm -hmm. but 15 days having the first barnacle already attached well it's it's pretty good yeah. indication so if somebody somebody finds uh, a shoe body part or whatever and it has barnacles i mean what what ends up happening do you end up flying somewhere or you end up you'd, or if it's a if it's a let's say it was just a shoe would they could they send it to you or do you typically go to them or how does that typically work and then what do you what do you measure with respect to the barnacles like is width height rings uh, or i'm not sure what you call the those growth rings like we we rec we said that were like trees yeah so in um <laughs> when there was no COVID time for me there was yes the possibility to fly right. wherever uh wherever the the case was because it's it's kind of not safe to send the uh the evidence all over yeah. the places and maybe they had to stay in a certain spot and things so you work in the facility where the um the evidence is um otherwise it's sometimes it's, it's good enough to have very good pictures uh, but the picture had to be in a macro with scale mm -hmm. and, and maybe you had to be able to ask the person to give us more information more um uh, more details about certain part of the uh, of the picture you can start with the picture and then go uh, a little bit deeper we are actually writing a paper right now um or it's a conference paper that's been accepted recently um about remote um uh, remote assessment because oh, nowadays okay. is what, what we have to do especially when you are when we are an experts like like me that do there are not that many so we had to do this remote uh, consultation remote expert uh, witnesses uh, and can be they can there can be big limits um otherwise what i can ask is is a sample of a random sample or trying to ask look i need 
whatever you have, mm -hmm. if you have things in different colors, in different shape, send us, but I need a, a, a decent number because I need to do some stats on, on the numbers. Depending on the species, uh, I can take different measurements. So for example, the barnacles that you saw on the shoe, they were goose barnacles. They look like little um, little yeah, goose beak of goose. Right, right, right. That's right. the reason why they're called. So we normally uh, consider the size of the capitulum, that is basically the, the shell, so the length. But when you have acorn barnacles, they are typically the one that you find on the, uh, on the, um, mm -hmm. on the rocks. You normally use the, uh, the base, the, the diameter of the base. And then when you had to look into the isotopes of the uh, of the shell, well, you need to have the shell because then you had to use uh, some technique like laser ablation or something. It depends what you have. Um, so so that's pretty much it. I just thought uh, I just had an idea as you were talking. I was because I do a lot of 3D stuff, but I just thought next time I get next time I go to the beach, I'm going to be getting to some barnacles or whatever, and I'm going to I'm going to scan them for you and see how what you can do with a nice. Uh, high detail, high resolution scan of a barnacle. That might be interesting to see. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some barnacles that are actually beautiful. Like uh, there is one in Australia that is called the Opera House barnacle because it looks like the Opera House. Oh, really? And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's actually um, the, the uh, scientific name is uh, is is given for to Darwin because it was the year of Darwin. Uh, in which it was discovered and was uh -huh. discovered by the director of the Western Australian Museum, Diana Jones, who is a barnacle expert. So it's very exciting. So some of the barnacles are actually oh, very cool. nice. You've done a ton of research, like I've been reading through it. It's actually quite fascinating, really interesting to uh, to read for me anyway. I, I, I mean, I love animals and everything, and the fact that we can use animals to help in these kinds of investigations is pretty cool. Um, what kind of research are you working on now? Uh, yeah. what, kind of, what kind of cool stuff can you tell us without uh, giving away too much? Oh, I have a very brilliant student on my Master of Forensic Science who is working on uh, uh, textile analysis and forensic entomology, again, combined, so terrestrial what's, environment. What's, what's her name? Uh, Stevie. Stevie. Stevie Ziogos. Yeah, Stevie Ziogos. Um, is, uh, he decided to... Yeah, to to do an experiment using 116 piglets. Oh, okay. <laughs> and these piglets are all dressed up. Uh, we use four different type of fabrics, or oh, three different type of fabrics. So no, how many? One, two, yeah, three different type of fabrics: uh, cotton, blend, and lycra. In terms of different amount of elastic. Mm -hmm. fibers within the uh, within the fabric, we stabbed and we teared apart this fabric and, and we also had controls and we left these pigs to decompose in the uh, in the Australian environment for an, an amount of time. And so the 116 comes because of all of these repetitions and all of this um, time that we had to uh, take samples and things. So. People that normally study dressed up pigs, they want to study the effect of the, the dress up or the clothes on the colonization. So how insects uh, are affected by clothing. So mm -hmm. maybe it takes longer for the composition. What we want to do is exactly the opposite. What is the effect of the presence of the bugs on the uh, artifacts that are present on the, uh, on the fabric? So how the bugs affect the tear rather than the cut mm. or rather than nothing. And this is extremely important because when you find a highly decomposed body or when you find only bones and you are still the clothes because the clothes takes longer to, uh, to decompose, if they decompose, the cut is always a big question mark. Is a cut is something that happened because just happened? Is because of the composition? Is because of the environment? Or is because of the bugs that tear the thing apart? This is the first time they were asked, answering to these kind of questions. And we also made a specific machine that is a stabbing machine in order to have this stab happening <laughs> always in the same time. So this has been a com complex um, experiment. They were mm -hmm. uh, about to finish where in the in the analysis time. It's been pretty pretty interesting because it was 
extremely hard to work on so because we started when they were like 35 degree in the bush in australia lots of flies yeah, yeah. Uh, but this this uh, this student is is brilliant and we're having incredible results uh it's it's really really interesting from the aquatic point of view instead we are working on uh, uh washing machines, <laughs> washing machines. So, okay so okay uh, what i like to do is uh, i hate science for science i really want to uh, keep real uh, my experiment things okay. that really happen in real life so what if you are the perpetrator of a crime and you drown someone okay so you had to be in the water with this person and your clothes will get full of water and diatoms and that happened before and there are not many but a few works about that i had a few cases that were resolved because we were able to place the suspect at the scene because of the diatom found in the uh, in the clothes but we were just lucky because this person decided to don't trash his clothes or don't no. wash his clothes what if you are particularly you know keen or fond on this particular jacket that you're wearing the day in which you're killing someone <laughs> and you decide to wash it uh, and you're washing a washing machine because you don't wash like old style uh, non <laughs> in this sense what is the effect of washing machine this is something that the jury or the um or the lawyer or the counterpart will ask you if you are an expert is they say do you don't find diatoms because the diatoms are not there or because they're being washed mm -hmm. so we're trying to answer to this question and we're using different fabrics we're using different co um, concentration of diatoms using different species of diatoms because different species have different shape so they can go into the fabric different in a different way we're using different uh, washing machine top loader front loader we use soap no soap uh, uh, <laughs> we, we were we were wondering about we're gonna use the softener so i think you after killing someone you are too busy to think about the softener uh, so so maybe just use the the normal the normal soap and then because everything is not done so all the variable that you have to think about you have to think about variables repetitions uh, different fabrics different amount so sometimes it comes up that we have so many data or we had to do so many repetitions and they um the the research is only six months or a year long depending on uh, the the structure of the master right. for the students so, so we're working on these two in particular and then there are things going on everywhere in the world and other things but yeah these are the two ongoing right now at the moment no oh, that's cool we're getting on in time but i just have a couple more questions so one is um in in western australia and with the university and everything um so for example in some places it's very restrictive to do research or whatever do you find that it, it's fairly easy people are cooperative they're they're like yeah they're very interested in your research and, and they open some doors for you uh, it depends. It depends. Uh, majority of the answer I can give you starts always with it depends. Mm. Uh, we have very strict rules in terms of uh, human ethics and animal ethics. Uh, so we always had to go through a committee to accept what we do. Uh, so we try to make things easier and simpler for, uh, for our research to be accepted. For example, in the case of the 116 pigs, uh, we decided to go with uh, stillborn piglets that mm. obviously we didn't have right. to kill anyone for right. uh, for anything at the same time uh, for biosecurity reasons we are not we don't need a big space we don't need crazy stuff um, same story for um, for the uh, the experiment with the shoes or with the clothes the best would be obviously to have an animal covered uh, or a human body donated to science, clothed and then put in the water, mm -hmm. but they will never accept to have uh, organic matter in water for right. six months for, right. water, for a bunch of reasons. Um, so we tried to keep things simple. We had to justify that we had to keep things simple uh, in our papers, but there is not much, this is the best we can do with our resources. Um, in terms of students i love the fact that we, they are very understanding of the fact that i don't want to go rocket science i want to stay very real uh, so i'm not going to go for a strange machine i want to work on washing machines so they said, oh, 
I don't. I wanna. <laughs> I wanna get the uh, Nobel Prize. I'm not gonna get the Nobel Prize for wash, working yeah, on a yeah. washing machine. But you don't know because this is the work that will probably solve a case one day because this is what you have at home. Um, so, so lots of understanding. Um, I have many people from the Australia police or Tasmania police that worked with us uh, in different experiments. For example, we did uh, some decomposition studies in Tasmania with the strict collaboration of two uh, policemen in two different districts of, uh, of Tasmania. They were doing the job because they are interested, because they believe that this was important because in Tasmania there are two works in forensic entomology and one is ours. Uh, so yeah, many, Yes, there, there is understanding and there is collaboration. Obviously, we have to go through the right channels uh, in terms of we don't have to do sneaky research. We had to have all the permissions because mm -hmm. if not, we will go in trouble of doing the research, having the data, and we cannot publish because it's not, um, it's not accepted by the community or the ethic uh, committee. Okay. Well, you mentioned collaborations. That was going to be another question I had, which was, you know, if, if the police work closely with you, if they're interested in your research and they help you out at times, uh, do you find that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, obviously, um, toxicology, DNA, uh, pathology are the main things. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to nature, uh, they... <laughs> It's less, there is less understanding in terms of what, how nature can be helpful. But when they understand the power of nature that we can't control, because, you know, uh, you know, a perpetrator can wear gloves, can wear a mask, especially these days. Everyone is wearing gloves and masks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And they can be very careful. All of these um, information evidence uh, come from, from any kind of movies. But when we talk about diatoms, when you could talk about insects, there is less understanding. So there is actually more sources of information in a real case because the bad guy doesn't think about these kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so they are happy to have someone that work in this direction and they are happy to help us out to gain, to gain more information. That's amazing. Well, Paula, we're getting on in time. So I just want to say thank you so much. This is a, a fascinating area. You got, you've done some amazing work and I hope, uh, wish you all the best and future research and uh, keep keep pushing hard. It looks, it's fantastic. What you're doing. <laughs> thank you for having me. I was always, uh, it's, for me, it's just, yeah, talking about what I'm passionate about and uh, uh, also acknowledge all the people I work with, uh, from the students to the police to my colleagues. Uh, these publications and these research are not ba made by myself. I keep saying that Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist. There is only the, the sol solving a case is a teamwork. It's mm -hmm. about communication, collaboration, understanding. Uh, it's about yeah, positive vibes and uh, and uh, yeah, working hard because <laughs> cases are hard and research is hard. But yeah, I love this job and I love the people I work with. Well, it shows. So, uh, good for you. <laughs> All right. You have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. Well, that's it, folks. That does it for the interview with Paula. I want to thank her so much for taking uh, the time out of her busy day uh, to speak with me. Uh, it's unfortunate we couldn't do it live, but uh, hey, we were able to get uh, some really great information from her. And I want to wish her all the best in her research and uh, and everything else that she's been doing some really great work. So uh, that does it for episode 31. Don't forget the Cloud Compare course next week, May 4th and 5th. If you're interested in that, just go to my website, ai2-3d.com. You'll see it there for sure. And also the Canadian Society of Forensic Science Conference. While we were uh, running this or whatever, somebody actually signed up already. So thank you for doing that. And uh, on that note, I want to say thank you to uh, Diego from Chile, from Leopold from Trinidad, Madi from... Uh, from Florida and uh, and all the rest of you. Thank you very much. And God willing, uh, we'll be here next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. So thanks a lot, everyone. And I wish you all the best. Bye-bye.